All right, now we have gotten our sides thicknessed and bent. We've gotten our end blocks in. We have gotten our kerfing in. We've gotten everything radiused. It's starting to look like a guitar. Now we're going to do side struts. Side struts are braces that go along the sides and they reach from one kerfing to the next and they span this gap. They go in here like this and their whole purpose is to stop, intercept, and interrupt any cracks that are going to happen. You'll see them typically on the flats here, here, maybe one in the upper bout, maybe one more here, um, or three here, one here. We just want to space them out so that they're able to intercept those cracks. The material can be really just about anything. Um, they can be an extra binding. They can be an offcut from the backs, from the sides. Our key is that we need something fairly narrow and so that the grain is going perpendicular to the grain on the side. We want that grain to go up and down so we can intercept those cracks. Some people have even used wide flat tape um, cloth, cut them to size, soaked them in glue, put them onto the, the sides, and that does it. They can really be anything. You can laminate them. Uh, I'll show you a couple of mine. Here are some laminations that I've done. So I'll just uh, lay up some pieces, clamp them up, slice them and then cut them to size and uh, install them here. I've even done X braces. So I've done miniature X braces. And those I will put right above the waist on the flats here and here. Since the flats are most susceptible to those cracks, that's where I'll put these X braces. So really they can be anything you want. They can be, uh, like I said, an extra piece of binding. Just long, flat, cut it to size, we'll sand it down a little bit, and glue those into place. It doesn't have to be fancy, it just has to be vertical grain, and put from completely from kerf to kerf, so that we have no spaces, gaps, or any glue issues that are going to cause us to miss one of those cracks that happen. For my side struts, my plan is to use this stick of ebony binding. I'm going to put one here on the flat part of this waist, put one here, put one here, and here. So I'm going to mark those out. Give myself a little bit of room to creep up to. Just cut them with the uh, pull saw. Try to organize them shortest to longest. Okay, I'll take this one and I'll duplicate it. Duplicate this one. Now the ebony I like because um, it gives a nice contrast to the uh, all the woods on the interior, but it's also going to match my binding because I'm using ebony binding on this as well. I'm going to get them sanded to size here on the disc sander, put them into place, and then glue them in. There the side struts are, each of them in place, and then I will glue those in and duplicate those on the other side because I do want them to be symmetrical. I'm going to get one side in first, 
measure, and then cut and sand and glue. So these are exactly where I want them. They are stuck into place. I don't think they're gonna move unless I hit this real hard. So I might as well take a look at getting the other side set up identically. One way that we could do it is we could take a, like a cloth measuring tape, something soft to measure the sides. We could try and do some geometry, like from this point to here, to here, to here. But really one of the easiest ways is to just count the number of curves. And if we start up here at the top, where at the heel block, which is where we started our kerfing, we should end up almost identical on both sides. So for this first one, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, on the 27th one. That one, and then we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven more. Eleven. All these marks, I just have to cut these and get these dialed in so that they're going to fit in these spots. Now I have all these fit into place. What you really want to see is that when you press them into place, that they'll stay, that you kind of feel them squeeze in between the kerfing, um, the upper and the lower. And once that happens, you're, and you're confident that they're going to stay, that they're in there pretty solid, and we don't have any gaps in, on either side, then it's time to glue them up. These spring clamps are really perfect for doing this specific task. Make sure that you're gluing the ends of these as well. So that they glue themselves to the kerfing. We'll let these dry for a few minutes and then I will scrape the glue, all that squeeze out, I'll scrape that with the razor and then I will get the other side. Now I'm just taking the clamps off one pair at a time. Scraping the glue. When you're scraping down the sides like this, you do want to make sure that you're not leaving big scrapes vertically across the grain. So just watch out for that. You want to angle your razor just a little bit to avoid coming across the grain exactly perpendicular. So I'll repeat this all the way around and then we'll let the glue dry for about another 30 minutes and then take the clamps off. Now we are going to work on the end wedge. The end wedge is going to be the decorative strip that is going to cover these two seams uh, right on the end of the tail block. 
Typically, we want to match your end wedge to whatever you're going to use for the bindings. I am using ebony on my bindings, so I'm going to use ebony on the end wedge. Those bindings are going to come around here and they're going to tie into this end wedge. And you can do a contrasting color, you can do something different, but it usually looks much better if they match and you've got a nice continuous color and pattern that's going to go the entire length there. Now we do call it a wedge. You can use a strip, you can use a straight strip, you can use an extra piece of binding if you want to cut this exactly the width of that and if you think you can match that up, that's fine. And some people actually get super fancy and they can do all kinds of inlay work on here. Um, I've seen curves, I've seen boxes, I've seen uh, alternating kind of funky laminations, I've seen uh, inlay work that does a zigzag around it. You can do whatever you want. The wedge is going to be the easiest one to do because we can um, fit it in there the best, the easiest, and it's the most flexible. That's what I'm going to do this time and that's what I recommend everybody else do. So let's lay that wedge out and see how this is going to work. We usually want to do the wedge so it has a little bit of a taper, not too much. And also, we don't want to make them too big. If they're too big, they can start to interfere with that nice curve that we have here. So if, it's, if, if your wedge spreads this gap too far, it's going to have a hard time conforming to this. And it just looks a little goofy as well. Um, if if that becomes too big. So not too big, not too small. We're gonna go medium. If you have a grain that you're trying to follow, you can certainly figure out where that's gonna orient. In this piece on my ebony, grain's pretty straight. There's not much we have to worry about. So what I want to do is just give myself a straight line that we're gonna use as the center line. And I'm going to come off of one of these sides somewhere in the middle. Doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, let's go right here. That didn't help. Here. Okay, now I got my center line. So to create this wedge, we just want to measure equal distances on either side here and make it larger here or the other way around, doesn't matter. For this, I want to start out pretty narrow. I'm gonna go five millimeters on each side. And then up here, I'm gonna go 10 millimeters on each side. Now that's a fairly narrow wedge. You can go larger than that if you'd like to. But I am also going to put purfling strips on each side so that I can tie into the purfling that I'm using on the uh, guitar, on the bindings. So this is gonna work just fine for me. I'm gonna carry that line all the way out and cut that and trim those out. I'm gonna use the band saw for this and then trim it up with a hand plane.
So I'm going to trim this off a little bit. It's a little bit narrow down here. I don't need quite that much um, height on this. To trim this up, I am going to use a shooting board. Now to call this a shooting board is a little bit of an insult to shooting boards everywhere. Um, this is not squared up. This is just simply meant to provide me a little bit of um, an end here that I can plane up against. It's got a little bit of, it's got a little bench hook on it. It's got um, this board to push up against. That's it. We can make a shooting board later, but for right now, this is gonna work just fine. You can actually take care of this with um, probably a uh, belt sander. You can just bump it up against it with a disc sander like uh, we did on the side struts. There are a number of ways you can do this. I'm just gonna shoot it with a plane. It should be fairly quick. Now I've got a low angle jack plane. You can use a really any plane that has a nice 90 degree angle here. I'm just gonna try to go up to that line that I made. The line wasn't too crisp. Uh, but that is pretty good. Let's see how close we can get on this side. Depending on how sharp your plane is and how aggressive the grain lines run, again, we we can run into issues going uphill or downhill on this. So if you feel something grabbing, just flip it around and even flip it this way and try to make adjustments from there. It's not worth having a big chunk of tear out just so you can see this line. Yeah, that's about even there. So now we can use this center line to line up on the guitar itself. We should be in good shape. Before we cut the wedge out of the guitar body itself, we just need to re-mark the center lines because we got rid of those during the radiusing process. Again, we are 76 millimeters wide on the block. So we need to go to 38. And we are lined up perfectly on that seam. That's great. Well, let's take a look at the other side. See how close we are here. Seventy six, thirty eight. All right. Yeah, that's great. All right. In this case, I am going to see if I can mark this. I don't know that it'll make much of a difference. We are pretty much right down the line. Yeah, I'm not even gonna be able to get a pencil line on that because it's right on that seam. The seam's not perfect, but we can line this up on the top and bottom. Well, let's establish top and back. This is my top, this is my back. So on the top of the guitar, do you want the wedge to go this way or this way? It's really up to you. It's a design preference. I like mine to have the thicker part of the wedge on the towards the top of the guitar, but it doesn't make a big difference. Either way, it's up to you. Now, we want to use the wedge itself to make the mark on the guitar. I'm going to grab a couple of spring clamps. What I want to do here, making sure that I remember which way is the top, which way is the bottom, is I am going to 
line that wedge up like this so that I can see the center line on the wedge and the center line on the block. I'm going to clip that into place. Once I have these lined up, happy with the way that looks, happy with the way that looks. Now I turn it over and mark my lines across here. Now that I've got my center lines lined up with each other here and here, I am flipping it back over and I'm going to mark this line with a mechanical pencil. That's going to give me a more distinct line than the white pencil is, um, or accurate line I should say. That the white pencil, colored pencils are just a little bit soft and the grain can affect them and you can end up with a little bit of a zigzag. That is not the case with these mechanical pencils. I have clamped this extension board off of my bench so that I can slide the guitar body over the end so that we can work on this on a stable surface so and not damage the guitar itself. What we want to do is for these cuts I like to use this uh, Japanese dazuki saw. You can use really any kind of back saw, any kind of um, saw that's going to be stiff. You can use a flush cut saw, but generally these longer straighter lines, you, it is nice to have this back on it. Dovetail saw, cross cut saw, any of those will work. And what I'm doing with this, folding this piece of sandpaper over, putting it here, so that I get a good grip on this piece of wood that I'm using as my saw guide. Lining that, that up on the line. You want to be careful to only go down to the block itself, just through you don't want to cut too much into that block. That should be okay. And we'll flip this around. And I flipped that around because I want to protect the part that we're going to keep. I want to keep my guide in my blade from cutting into this good part of the guitar. If the blade wanders, it's going to wander in to what I'm cutting off in the, uh, off the waste material. So that is not a big deal. Nope. Now it's time to clean this out. For this, I am going to use a chisel. Right about here is where I'm going to stop because if I continue out this way, I could blow the top of this out. I don't want to do that. So let's slide it around and work from the other direction. I also like to come back in with a razor or a scraper.
and try and make sure with, that we've got rid of this glue so we can expose the bare wood because the, the um, yellow wood glue is not going to stick to itself. So we need to make sure that we've got a wood surface to glue to. Now I've got this wedge pretty much cleaned out and just to do a test fit. Well, if I was only doing the wedge, I'd be in trouble, but I accommodated for that. I wanted that deeper because I need to put these purfling strips in. So one on each side. Let's see. That's pretty good fit. We're nice and tight on both ends. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, we're set. Now it is time to glue this in. Now if you are gluing the bindings in, you want to make sure that you get all sides of the binding and all sides of the wedge. So I'm going to put a little bead of glue in there. Make sure you get all that covered. Bead of glue on the other side of it. Same thing for this. bottom of this channel. Spread that all out. Great. That eh, might be a little too much. Take some of that. All right. Now the nice thing about the wedge is that it, for the most part, if you wedge that in there nice and tight, it's pretty much self-clamping. It's not really going to move, but I'll put a couple of spring clamps on it just to make sure. After I push this purfling down into that channel, the glue makes it want to raise up a little bit. Yeah, we'll get some squeeze out there, it's all right. Just going to make sure that perfectly is seated. Otherwise, when we sand it, it is quite easy to sand straight through the purfling if it's sitting proud. We do not want to see that happen. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Like I said, that wedge is holding it in place just fine. Spring clamps just for a little insurance. And we'll let it sit there for 30 minutes or so. Come back to it and scrape it down. All right, we've gone about a half hour. I have taken the spring clamps off and I'm just getting started um, uh, to clean this off. I cleaned out, cleaned off some of the glue squeeze out just with this razor, being very careful not to hit these sides cross grain and tear things out. Um, I am going to cut these off a little bit shorter. So when I'm scraping these off or planing these off, I don't want to put pressure on this and flip the whole guitar up if I don't have to. So just 
I'm not going to flush cut them all the way up there just yet. I just need to make that a little bit more convenient to work on. There we go. If you take a look at this, hopefully you can see this here. There's a pretty good ridge. You know, we're um, a millimeter and a half or so um, above this. So we've got to scrape this down. We can scrape it, we can plane it. And if we plane it, we do have to be pretty careful here. But getting closer for sure. Uh, I would try not to sand this just yet. Sanding is going to wear this pretty unevenly and it, especially if you use a, a random orbital, uh, any kind of power sander, we definitely don't want to do that because it can do get things uneven. We can put a hole in it, we can round off the edge. All kinds of bad things can happen. I would stick with even a, a razor to use as a scraper. can make progress pretty quickly with a razor. One of the other issues with a sander at this point is that we've got grain in different directions. And if you try to sand this block down with this grain, you're gonna end up with cross grain scratches here. And if you try to go across this way, it, they're just the, the grain direction already is gonna be trouble with a uh, sander. So tr just try to use a cabinet scraper, razor, plane. This is super close to flush. You want to feel it and make sure there's no obvious um, issues with it. I'm going to feel a little bit right here. Now when we end up sanding the sides and prepping the sides for binding, we can maybe touch this up a little bit more, but I don't have a need to get this much thinner. What can happen when we uh, run the router for the bindings? Because the router bit is going to reference the side. So if we're if the bearings on the side and we're coming up along here and we hit this and it goes boom and comes over again, it, it's going to leave us a goofy spot in our binding channels. And we'll get to that later. But really now is the time to take care of this end wedge. So I think right now I will just flush cut it off. It's close enough. The other side. Do this right handed. It doesn't have to be perfect. Yeah, because we will take care of these in the radius dish. But if we can get it a little bit closer, we'll be better off so that it doesn't um, kind of rip itself out of its channel if this is hanging over too long. That looks good. We're set for now. We are now ready to wrap it up with the sides. We've done a lot to get to this point so far, so good job. We've thicknessed, we've sanded, we've scraped, we've bent, we've planed, we've cut. We've done a lot of stuff to get to this point, so well done. Next, we are going to move on to the back, and we won't come back to the sides until we are ready to attach the back. So for right now, we're going to get the rims, the sides, back in the mold. We'll put the spreaders in to make sure it keeps its shape until we are ready to attach. So good job. See you in the next chapter.